Scott Williams here is the Cultural Resources Program Manager for the Washington State Department of Transportation. He has nearly 40 years of experience conducting multidisciplinary archaeological research in the Pacific Northwest and the Pacific Basin. Prior to joining the Washington State Department of Transportation, he worked in a variety of government and private sector archaeology positions, including the Washington State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Bishop Museum in Honolulu, and private CRM firms. He is one of the founding members of the nonprofit Maritime Archaeological Society and serves as its current executive director. Since 2006, he has been the principal investigator of the Beeswax Rec Project. And Scott Williams, um, executive, uh, executive director of the Maritime Archaeological Society, will be discussing the history of Oregon's Beeswax Rec and the finding and recovery last year of wooden remains of the ship near Nehalem, Oregon. Um, let's go ahead and hear what you have. Take it away, Scott. Okay, thanks. I'm going to share my screen here. Hang on. And everybody, please mute yourself on Zoom. <laughs> and turn off uh, video also. Okay, hopefully. That looks good. You can see it and it should be starting. There, that looks fine. Okay. Well, thank you all for uh, joining me tonight. Um, I, I apologize. I could not be at OMSI in person, which would have been my preference, but this week just didn't work out to make the drive down to Portland, unfortunately. Uh, so hopefully this will work. I will run through my slides, uh, not too quickly, I hope, but I do want to leave time for questions. There's uh, so much information. We've been working on this project so long that trying to condense it down to a talk, I always forget something. So with that, I will jump into it. Uh, I've spoken to OAS before, but I do want to just give just a really quick background for anyone who's new, who may not be familiar with what the beeswax wreck is. So, uh, you know, why, how did it get the name beeswax wreck? So early explorers and traders uh, to the Pacific Northwest noted that there was a wrecked vessel on the Nehalem Spit or off the Nehalem Spit uh, in Northern Oregon, about 40 miles south of the Columbia River. And they knew this vessel was old. The, the local Nehalem and Clatsop Indians told them it had wrecked many years ago. Uh, the first settlers there saw it and it was old then. So it, it was a mystery wreck. It predated the known European exploration and settlement of the Northwest. And what made it really odd to the American settlers and the, the uh, British fur traders who came in was that there was abundant beeswax in large molded blocks. And that's a picture with that 67 molded into it, uh, scattered all over the beach, as well as ship's timbers. There was portions of the hull that were seen, mast, mast step, planks, that kind of thing. So the wreck was very well known during the 19th and early 20th centuries. So uh, archaeologists actually became interested in the wreck in the 1980s uh, with Dr. John Woodward and uh, Allison Stinger in the 1990s. Uh, both did some projects looking at the wreck and, and talking about the, the possible origin of the wreck. I got involved in 2006, we formed what we called the Beeswax Rec Project, which is now a project of the Maritime Archaeological Society. So it's basically, it's a group of archaeologists, historians, you know, geologists, community members, students. We're all volunteers with an interest in history and archaeology. Uh, the Maritime Archaeological Society is a registered 501c3 nonprofit. We are not trying to salvage the wreck. It's not a treasure hunt. Uh, it's an archeological site and a historic shipwreck. So it is protected by Oregon state law and by federal law, also by international law. Uh, so what we're really interested in is trying to solve the question of uh, when did the shipwreck, what ship was it? Where was it coming from? Where was it going to? And so I'll give you those answers tonight. So just to put us in place, uh, the Nehalem River, like I said, about 40 miles south of the Columbia, near the town of Manzanita in Nehalem, Oregon. You can see on this map, and I think, yeah, my cursor, you may be able to see my cursor, but the Nehalem River comes out of the coast range. It makes this 90 degree turn towards the ocean, then another 90 degree turn, and it flows behind the Nehalem sand spit. 
And it does that for about three miles and then makes this final 90 degree turn to exit into the ocean. And here is an aerial photo of the sand spit from about oh, 10 years ago. You can see uh, it's it's vegetated that all that yellow is scotch broom and European dune grass. Uh, the dark green is shore pines. Um, <clears throat> and um, if you can see my cursor, the jetties are here. These jetties were built in 1918 to try to make a better entrance to the Nehalem River. And you could hopefully just make out uh, this line of darker scotch broom and shore grass. That's the original extent of the spit before the jetties were built. So this next picture is the Nehalem spit in 1936. You can see it's a barren sand spit. The jetties have been in place for about 20 years, uh, and, and there's all this new sand that has built up to the south of the Nehalem River mouth, and this area was all part of the Nehalem River mouth, and then here along the north jetty. Uh, and one thing I want you to remember from this picture is how barren that sand spit was back then, because that's what allowed uh, the Nehalem Indians at first, and then the American settlers to look for and find the beeswax. They could they could walk along the spit and as the sand dunes moved, uh, they would alternately bury and expose beeswax. And they did that for a hundred years until Oregon State Parks planted the vegetation to, to stabilize the dune in the 1950s. So tonight I'm gonna throw a bunch of things at you and tell you like, here's where the ship came from. Here's where it was going. Uh, here's what ship it was. <clears throat> so some of those things I'm just going to toss out and you'll you'll either have to accept it that I know what I'm talking about or ask me questions later. But basically, how do we know what we know? Uh, and over the years, there's been so much written about and talked about the beeswax wreck from literally uh, 1813 up until today. And a guy writing in 1920 noted how the stories conflict and contradict each other and the elements get mixed. So these stories are, we have oral histories, which were what the Indians, the local Nehalem and Clatsop Indians told to early travelers and settlers. Then we have the stories they told to scientists who came to the area in the late 19th century. And then non-Indian stories, the settlers and travelers telling stories to each other. Then there's the written history, which starts with explorers and fur traders, continues with the missionaries and the early settlers and travelers, uh, and then those scientists who came in, anthropologists and geologists <laughs> in the late 19th and early 20th century. So a lot of what I'm going to tell you comes from these sources. So just really quickly, hopefully you've all seen... Um, Samples of the beeswax, if not, almost every coastal museum has at least a piece or two. So the Columbia River Maritime Museum in Astoria, uh, the Tillamook County Pioneer Museum in Tillamook, the Halem Valley Historical Society in Manzanita. I believe the museum in Garibaldi has some, the Cannon Beach Museum has some. But these are large blocks of beeswax, often with symbols or numbers carved into them. And that lower right picture of those uh, 12 symbols is from 1921 and it's just an example of some of the symbols that were found in the beeswax. Some beeswax also had initials or numbers carved into it and a lot of the blocks were noticed to have um, the initials IHS and my Latin is horrible but it's basically it's the initials in Latin for in uh, in Jesus's name or in his name. It was common for articles for the Catholic Church to have those initials on them. Uh, over the years, besides beeswax, other artifacts from the shipwreck have been found, a couple of wooden pulley blocks, uh, a wooden wheel, a small silver oil jar there in the um, upper left, and two bronze chest handles that uh, were identified as having come from a Chinese chest made in the 17th century, I believe. Uh, that that rigging block in the upper right was actually taken off 
a portion of the shipwreck exposed at a very low tide, excuse me, exposed at a very low tide in 1898 uh, by a local um, treasure hunter by the name of Pat Smith, who walked out to the shipwreck at a very low tide to collect beeswax and to cut off teak boards to make into uh, wooden walking sticks. And he cut that pulley off, a stub of the mast, and uh, gave it to the Benton County, well, he actually gave it to a, another person, but it wound up at the Benton County Historical Museum in Philomath. So that's still existing. The bottom pulley block is at the Columbia River Maritime Museum. That was actually found in 1992 by a beachcomber on the Nehalem Beach. So in addition to those artifacts, Chinese porcelain and uh, Asian stoneware fragments have been washing up uh, really since the shipwrecked. We were fortunate to uh, meet up with some beachcombers who had been collecting little bits of porcelain off the beaches in the area for over 15 years. And one beachcomber in particular had uh, almost 1,600 sherds of porcelain that we were able to have analyzed. We had a graduate student at Central Washington University who did her master's thesis analyzing the porcelain. So although it's broken up, there are enough stylistic details preserved to be able to give us a pretty tight um, time period on that porcelain. So much better than radiocarbon dating, for example. The porcelain all dates to the period between 1680 and 1700. And there's enough bits and pieces left to say a lot of that porcelain cargo was actually coffee and hot chocolate cups rather than, say, teacups. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So what all this tells us is that the beeswax wreck was a manila galleon. You know, it was carrying Philippine beeswax or beeswax from the Philippines with Spanish shipping symbols on it. The porcelain is Chinese export porcelain for New Spain, which is Mexico and South America. It was not porcelain manufactured for um, uh, the Middle East. It was not porcelain manufactured for China or for Japan or Korea. It was made for New Spain. And we know that from the coffee and hot chocolate cups. And a single... Spanish Manila Galleon explains all those finds. There is no Chinese junk wrecked at Nehalem. There were no pirates. There's no Francis Drake. It all came from one ship, uh, which I will tell you which ship here in a moment. So a little bit about the Manila Galleons. This is a modern reproduction of one. You may be able to just make out some people standing there on the bowsprit. This would be a small galleon. This, this galleon is about 85 feet in length. Uh, the Manila Galleons were the largest wooden sailing ships of their day. So they were about 150 feet in length, about 50 feet in beam. And they could carry up to, well, the largest could carry up to 2,000 tons of cargo. Uh, the, the one that wrecked at Nehalem probably was a 1,600 ton ship. So, and what these, the reason they're called Manila Galleons is the Spanish had a colony in the Philippines, founded in 1565. And the whole reason for that colony in Manila was to get Chinese luxury goods. They could not trade directly with China because China was the sole dominion of the Portuguese for European trade. So they set up a colony in Manila. They would buy Asian luxury goods, which included uh, porcelains, silk, cottons, spice, and Asian art, like carved ivory, um, Japanese lacquerware, that kind of thing. And then because of the way the trade winds and the, the currents work in the Pacific, pretty much you could only make one voyage back to Mexico a year. So once a year, they would load up a large galleon, uh, and it was almost always one galleon. Early on in the trade, there were sometimes two, but for most of the trade, it was one galleon. That ship would leave Manila. It would sail north towards Japan. It could not stop in Japan because Japan was closed. Um, then when it got in the North Pacific, it would start sailing east and they would continue to sail east until they saw some sign of land. They didn't actually have to see North America if they saw uh, seals, driftwood, kelp, they would turn south 
and they would not stop until they got to Acapulco, Mexico. That voyage from Manila to Acapulco, if you were lucky, took six months. Some years it took seven or eight months, sometimes nine months. One ship took 12 months to make the voyage. Once they were in Acapulco, they would unload the cargo, sell it for a fantastic profit um, because everybody wanted Asian luxury goods. And in return, they would sell it for silver. And silver was the only thing the Europeans had that the Chinese were really interested in. And the Spanish happened to be sitting on the world's largest silver mines at the time. So they would load up all that silver, sail back to the Philippines. And that voyage only took three months, sometimes four much more pleasant. You were further south in the Pacific, um, so it was much warmer. Uh, they get back to the Philippines and they would repeat that process. So for 250 years, this trade went on. Uh, and during that period, <clears throat> the Spanish we had to carry we had to carry that beam over all these rocks into the water. We strapped life jackets to it. And the, the Nehalem Surf Rescue guys um, hauled it back to the beach for us. There was no way we could have carried that beam back over the rocks. So uh, here's a picture of some of the beams that have been recovered. They don't look like much. They are um, eroded. They're, uh, you know, they've got marine life damage to them. Um, but what they all have in common is you can make out some shapes. Uh, you can make out intact spike holes. Uh, and they're all a tropical hardwood known as molave. And molave is a wood that is endemic to the Philippines. It does not come from China. Uh, oh. It does not come from Southeast Asia. It only grows in the Philippines. And it was a wood used to make manila galleons. So further proof that this wreckage, it's not a Chinese junk. It's not a Japanese junk. It's not a Portuguese merchantman. It's a Spanish manila galleon. Um, that one big beam, which you can see here, we could see as we were cleaning it off that at one end, there was a little bit of metal embedded into the, the end of the beam, um, almost like a nail head, uh, but it wasn't iron. It looked to be bronze, <laughs> excuse me. So um, uh, the medical center in Astoria brought over their portable X-ray unit to the Columbia River Maritime Museum. And here's an x-ray of the end of that beam. This is looking down on it. But on the left, you see the pointed end of what is the tip of a broken off bronze spike. You see um, four square holes. Those are four square iron spike holes. Two of them that still have the iron residue uh, from those spikes. That's what that, that white material is. And here's a side view. You can see the tip of that bronze spike and uh, the shape of another longer spike hole there, then some wormholes off on the right of the screen. Here's, here's a close-up photo of one of those square spike holes with that iron crust in it. You can also see just to the left, there's a big notch in the beam. And a lot of the beams had uh, paired sets of those notches. And the size of the beams and those notches was enough to tell other galleon researchers who know much more about ship construction than I do, that these pieces of wood are from the upper works of a galleon. So this is not the lower hull. This would be what would be the stern castle or the forecastle. So that upper part of the deck. <clears throat> Craig also found uh, when he was out there in 2020, a section of iron chain which uh, at first had us a little bit confused. It's uh, the Spanish did not use anchor chains. They used anchor rope, anchor manila. Uh, they called it cable, but it was rope. <clears throat> but what they did use chains for is at the base of the mast shrouds. So this is, this is not from a Spanish galleon, but to hold the dead eyes to the hull, they had what were called chain plates and chains. So this drawing shows you know, big iron loops, but the Spanish used six to eight foot long chains. And that's what that iron chain is, which is another indication that this is probably a section of the upper, probably the, the stern castle or the forecastle that has uh, been exposed up here. So um, 
the beeswax rack. This is what we know. It, I, I have first contact in parentheses because we don't actually know it was the first contact of non-native peoples with native peoples. There could have been Japanese junks that wrecked earlier. There could have been earlier um, Europeans. Thomas Cavendish lost a ship somewhere in the North Pacific. Um, I'm I'm one of the firm believers that Francis Drake was actually somewhere in Oregon. I don't think he was far as far north as Nehalem, um, but you know there could have been English sailors earlier. But this is the first contact we know about with Europeans for the Nehalem and Clatsop Indians. So uh, the Santo Cristo de Burgos was a Manila galleon sailing to Acapulco with 234 crew and passengers. We know that from the Spanish archives. We know all the ship's officers' names. We know all the um, crew name. They're, they're all men. That was recorded. That does not mean there were no women on board. There could have been a female slave. Um, there could have been um, females who were not listed on the manifest. But as far as we know, they were all men. We know there were survivors of the shipwreck. The Nehalem in Clatsop. Indians have a strong oral history of the survivors of the wreck. Um, and, and that history goes back to the first encounters with the fur traders in 1813 to tell them that, yeah, there were survivors. They lived with the Nehalem Indians for several months. And then there was a, an altercation broke out, um, some kind of conflict. And I think the, the Spanish crew, the survivors actually fought with guns because there's an 1877 account written by a Smithsonian anthropologist who was on the Nehalem coast uh, working with the Nehalem Indians. And he wrote that the story is that the survivors resisted throwing stones behind them and under their arms with great force, which I think is a, a, an oral history account of musket balls being fired. Um, those survivors, despite the oral history saying they were all killed, they almost certainly left some descendants. And we know this because uh, family histories of shipwreck ancestors within those families and different families with different ancestors uh, intermarrying with each other. So <clears throat> what's next? Uh, the ship is identified. And when I say identified, I mean archaeologically identified. So we're 95% we're sure. Um, there's always a chance we're wrong. We're, we're, you know, if somebody comes up with new evidence tomorrow, we'll reevaluate that and think we're wrong. But so far, after 16 years of research or almost 17 years of research, we're we're 95 percent. I'm 99 percent certain it is the Santo Cristo de Burgos of 1693. Um, we hope to do some further analysis of, of the timbers. We've done radiocarbon dating. We've done species identification. Um, we'd like other galleon researchers to, to actually look at drawings and photographs to see if we can better pinpoint where on the ship the wood was done. This summer in um, 2022, we did some off, offshore surveys. We also did offshore surveys in... Um, earlier in the summer in 2022 with the University of Delaware doing magnetometer and side scan sonar and multi-beam sonar of Smuggler's Cove and the area just outside of it to see if there was any obvious shipwreck out in that area. Uh, and then the Maritime Archaeological Society went back and did some more mag surveys and some diving surveys. So that is the story of the beeswax wreck in the latest on it that we have. Um, we have a report that is currently under draft that will go to Oregon Shippo and Oregon State Parks here, hopefully in the next month or two. And then we plan to uh, get a more popular article out um, in some of the archeology span journals. And David, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can take questions. Okay, I should be stopped sharing. So I'm happy to take questions. I don't know how we want to do this. If, if folks want to put them in the chat or raise their hands or or if there's questions in the OMSI audience, if somebody can ask those. Uh, Julia, do you have anybody there with a question? Julia. 
Hopefully they were able to hear the whole talk. If anyone online has a question and wants to type it in the chat, um, I have the chat window open and, and happy to answer. I, you know, I, one thing while I'm waiting to see if anyone has questions, one thing I always forget to tell people and realize I forgot to tell this time is why was the ship carrying so much beeswax? And the reason the ship was carrying so much beeswax um, was that there were no native honeybees in the new world, or at least honeybees that produced a lot of beeswax when the Spanish got to the new world and the, the Catholic church required beeswax candles. Uh, so when the Spanish got to the Philippines, there was the giant Asian honeybee makes huge beehives, tons of beeswax. It was a utilitarian cargo, um, but they would ship tons of it. We know that from the Spanish record. So I have a question in the chat. Uh, Alice says, you said it wasn't likely the wood would have survived. So do you have any idea why it did? Yes, great question. <clears throat> the reason the wood survived was it was buried in a landslide. Uh, it was buried in a landslide shortly after washing into the shallows. We think that landslide was triggered by the mega quake of 1700. So the galleon wrecks in 16, late 1693, you know, call it November, December of 1693. The, the earthquake strikes in January of 1700, so six years later. So sometime in that six years, uh, portions of the sh of the shipwreck washed ashore in that area then they got completely buried by the landslide and for some reason um, whether it's rising sea level changing ocean currents uh the, the wood is starting to erode out so craig noticed it eroding out in 2013 it became fully visible in 2020 so that's how the wood got preserved once it was buried in the rocks boring marine organisms couldn't get to it and the waves couldn't wash it away so um says another question greg says it sounds like the wreck was lodged south of where the beams were found is that right and if yes why so that's kind of the ten thousand dollar question we still don't know exactly where the ship wrecked the the nehalem oral histories say there was wreckage all over the nehalem spit the early historic accounts talk about a section of the wreck in the ocean at the mouth of the Nehalem River and more wreckage on the spit itself. Um, they also talk about another ancient wreck and that's how they refer to it as another ancient wreck at the base of the cliffs of Neocani. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and that was assumed to be a different wreck, but we wonder if the ship may be wrecked on the cliffs at Neocani and then sections of it drifted south to the spit, maybe sections of it drifted north. The, the current switches north-south between summer and winter. Uh, and Smuggler Cove acts as a trap for, for floating material. So um, the beams were found north of where we assume the ship wrecked. And that could be because we're either wrong about where the ship wrecked or because they drifted north and got trapped in that area. Um, All right. Yes. Sorry, we had a couple questions here at OMSI. Sure. I forgot I was muted. <laughs> Go for it. Uh, okay, Scott. Uh, first question is, uh, if you search, the, there's an offshore rock called Falcon Rock, offshore from Short, Short Sand yes. Beach. Have you searched around that area? And two, I was reading, uh, reading your MAS uh, uh website this summer you were on a fundraising they said to you during your surveys you found a sonar anomaly offshore uh -huh. someplace yeah and is uh and you needed more additional uh, more sophisticated sonar to uh to identify that area is that off of short sand or is that off the shore from the nahalem spit sure thanks harvey mm -hmm. um so yes we have We've examined the area around Falcon Rock with sonar and with a magnetometer, and um, there's nothing obvious out there. Now, the ship was probably, well, not probably, the ship was carrying bronze cannons. Bronze cannons will not show up on a magnetometer. They'll show up on a side scan sonar if you have a, a, a high resolution enough sonar, but we did not see anything around Falcon Rock that looked like, you know, cannons or anchors. 
Uh, the sonar anomaly we wrote about in our last newsletter, we actually got some divers on um, in September. And it's a rock, unfortunately. Our, our two best candidates for possible wrecks just outside of Smuggler Cove and just south of Smuggler Cove both turned out to be rocks with no evidence of you know shipwreck pieces around them. So right now we don't have a good lead on if if there is a lower hull, that's what we would be looking for, where it might be. And I say if because we don't know if the tsunami uh, picked it all up and dumped it on the Nehalem spit. There are historic accounts of the lower hull being on the Nehalem spit. Uh, we don't know if it totally broke up or we don't know if it's offshore someplace and buried under, you know, six feet of sand. If it's under six feet of sand, we won't find it. So, Julie, right, any we got, other questions out of OMSI? we got a question over here. Are there any estimates of how many survivors there were, especially given the possibility that they were able to salvage their muskets, their gunpowder, and their musket balls? Yeah, so one one oral history says 30, that there were 30 survivors. There are some later accounts that say four survivors, but that that is mixing an account of a later shipwreck, another shipwreck closer to the mouth of the Columbia, where there was only four survivors. So, um, like you said, if they were able to salvage muskets and some other things, I think it was probably, you know, more than four. 30 would be a little more than 10% of the crew and passengers. And that sounds about right to me. So I'm guessing somewhere in that, you know, 20 to 30 range. And we got a question over here. What is the chance that both uh, ships wrecked in this area? Has there been any analysis of the wood to see if it came from one shipwreck or two shipwrecks or um, like the beeswax? Has there been any analysis whether it has come through two shipwrecks or just the one? So as far as we can tell... Um, there's no way to to actually know that radiocarbon dating isn't precise enough to you know say um, uh, within a short period of time. Now, if there was if the shipwrecks were a hundred or you know even better two hundred years apart, we might be able to say. But right now, uh, everything points to one shipwreck at least one shipwreck right there at Nahalo. Um, I could do a whole nother talk on other prehistoric shipwrecks on the North Oregon coast, of which there was at least two others. Um, but right now, the artifacts that are being found are all consistent with one shipwreck from the late, you know, 1690 to 1700. And I don't see, oh, we, we got one more question here to Amzi. Okay. And I got a couple more on the chat, so. Yeah. Is there any chance the survivors or the local people might have harvested the wood from the hull and burned it or made other things out of it and maybe I, I mean people do that on the Oregon coast now yes. <laughs> yes and absolutely in fact uh the Nehalem and Clatsop Indians you know incorporated a lot of the shipwreck remains into kind of their day-to-day -day lives they traded the beeswax up and down the coast uh they traded the porcelain up and down the coast or at least well, yeah, up and down the coast. The, the the Nehalem didn't really have much use for porcelain hot chocolate cups, but porcelain plates make great arrowheads and um, scrapers. So in the various museums, you, there are examples of porcelain made into projectile points, into arrowheads. Um, so I'm sure they, they made use of other materials, including the wood. And then when the, the first American settlers arrived, they did the same thing. They they mined the beeswax. Uh, that was something you did in your spare time to supplement your farming or fishing or logging income, was you mined beeswax and you sold it in Portland or Astoria or San Francisco. Um, and they collected the shipwreck timbers, either to make things out of or to make, you know, house beams and, and furniture out of. So the, the former mayor of Manzanita in the early 1920s was said to have three piles of teak shipwreck timber, each as large as his woodshed in his yard. And, you know, where all that wood went, we don't know now. So, okay, and Julie, is there anything else there? Otherwise, 
I think we're ready for the next chat one. Okay. So a of chance. the chat, uh, was the beeswax sold to the church or was it gifted to the church? Probably both. The church shipped its own beeswax, um, but a lot of it was also sold to families in Mexico. If you were a, a family of any means, you would use beeswax candles instead of you know something like tallow candles. Um, but some of it was paid to the church's taxes as well. So the other question is, do the Spanish records of the ship show there were Filipinos on board? So all the names in the in the crew list and the passenger list are, are Spanish names. But that doesn't mean they weren't Filipinos because they would have been given, you know, ban uh, sorry, baptized Spanish names. Um, we know the galleon crews uh, had a lot of Filipino sailors and a lot of Malaysian sailors. We also know the crews often in included people who were not Spanish. They included uh, English, French, um, Portuguese adventurers, sometimes, uh, at least earlier on in the trade, Japanese merchants and samurai were on the crew. Um, uh, people from the Middle East and North Africa could be on the crew. But the names are all basically Spanish. But that was something the Spanish did, was essentially gave everyone a Spanish name. Um, <clears throat> how do we know the cups were for coffee and hot chocolate rather than tea? Uh, coffee and hot chocolate cups are cylindrical and they have lids. So we've we found the lids, we found the cylindrical parts. Uh, Asian teacups are more, you know, the classic sort of bowl shaped, uh, smaller. Um, and more typically more delicate than a than a coffee cup. Um, and the designs were typical of things that were sent to the Spanish. Um, so two other questions. One is what kind of provisions sustained the crew for six to nine months? And has any evidence of those provisions been recovered? Uh, so we have great records of the of the provisions. We have great records um, from European travelers who traveled on the Manila galleons and and published books, essentially. So the, the provisions are best described as very poor. Um, uh, you can imagine being on a ship for six to nine months with no refrigeration, no good food preservation technology other than smoking or brining meat. Um, there are accounts that, you know, within two months or certainly three months, the food was just bad. They would supplement it with, with fish that they caught, but you know, the bugs, the rats, um, everything. The ships often had to ration water um, because they relied a lot on rainwater. So if the rains didn't come, the water supplies could run low. Uh, one galleon was built with two giant water tanks built into the hull so that the ship would not run out of water. And after the, after the ship was completed, when it was being loaded in Manila, the merchants broke open the water tanks to store more cargo in, so it could not carry the extra water. Um, so far, we have found no no evidence for any of those provisions, um, and I'm not aware of any being found in uh, archaeological sites nearby. Um, so another question is, did the galleons have boats that the survivors would have used to reach the shore? Or would the only way to reach the shore uh, with the weapons be if the ship was actually resting on the beach? As far as we know, if the galleon had a boat, it would have been like one small one. Uh, the ships left the Philippines, you know, from a dock. They arrived in Acapulco to a dock. The the distance from the deck to the water was like 20 feet. So it would be hard to launch a small boat. So I, I think the ship either grounded on the Nehalem spit or enough of it washed ashore that they could salvage uh, some of their weapons and supplies. There's also a 19th century account of mm -hmm. beeswax blocks that were found on the Nehalem spit that appeared to have been stacked up, like cached, like the survivors or somebody, it could have been the Indians, of uh, the Nehalem Indians, stacking it up on the spit as well. Um, the last question I have, what do we do if we're wandering the beach and we think uh, we find something that may be from the galleon? Call Shippo or call you. The, the absolute best thing you can do is photograph it um, with your cell phone if you have a cell phone, because that usually puts a geotag. 
photograph it with a scale and try to notify if you're at the Halem State Park or Oswald West State Park, uh, notify a park ranger. And um, if the thing is not in danger of being actively washed away, try to find a park ranger and show it to them so that they can collect it. Um, you can always email uh, the Maritime Archaeological Society or me a picture. Um, I get a lot of people emailing pictures of either things their family has owned for, you know, decades or something they've just found on the beach <clears throat> uh, to ask, you know, is this beeswax? Is it porcelain from the shipwreck? And I'm, I'm always happy to look at those pictures and try to answer the question. Sometimes it's hard to tell with porcelain or beeswax, but I will say there's a lot of paraffin wax floating around in the ocean. It, it's a byproduct of industrial modern pollution. So um, people do find wax on, on the Nehalem beaches. Usually I can tell if it's paraffin or, or shipwreck wax just from a photo. Sometimes I can't, but by all means, uh, if you can't find anyone at state parks, call the Oregon Shippo's office and tell them you think you found something from the galleon. I think that's a wonderful note to, to end on it. Do we have one more question here? I think we got one last question here for you. Hi, Scott. Uh, I mentioned that uh, that MAS member said he uh, told me he uh, he's marked on a map that he found porcelain fragments at Chrome Point mm -hmm. and somewhere on Neg Halen State Park. Are you going to follow up on that? Contact him, or have you contact him yet? And also, I'm writing a report, and I'm mentioning you, uh, and I've got about three or four paragraphs. I was going to. I can send you those paragraphs. Can you check that to make sure you're okay with that? That's for sure. the shell report. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Harvey. Um, the the porcelains found at Cronin's Point or along the Halem Bay. We we know about those. Those are actually from recorded archaeological sites. They're from um uh lag deposits, um, partly from from midden sites that were subsided during the earthquake. Um so yeah, we we are aware of those. Oregon State Parks is aware of those. Um, you know, those those are those are artifacts. We tell people please do not collect anything along the Nehalem Riverside um, or in Nehalem Bay because those are actually in archaeological sites. Some of the porcelains that are washing up at at Smuggler's Cove or on the Nehalem Spit are are literally washing in and out. We've had beachcombers, you know, um, show us. Um, with video, like here comes a wave with a little piece of porcelain tumbling in, and then it stops. And then here comes another wave and tumbles it some more. Um, you know, th those kinds of things, Oregon State Parks would still prefer you left them in place and, and did not pick them up. Um, but certainly anything along the Nehalem Riverside, the Nehalem Bay, Fishery Point, uh, along the Nehalem River, those are from archaeological deposits and, and need to be left in place. All right. I think that was a wonderful talk. We got Thank actually you. quite a few people here at OMSI for you. This is great. And um, I think we all want to thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. <Scott. laughs> well, thank you all uh, for bearing with me. I know I went for an hour, um, so my apologies, but thank you for taking the time. Uh, tonight, everyone on Zoom and in OMSI. I hope I came across well enough for the folks there at OMSI, uh, since my preference would have been to actually be there, but thank you. Yeah, I think we got you up on the big screen and we, we got a lot. So thank you Great. so much for giving us your talk. And um, well, thank you everybody for showing up tonight. I think it was fantastic. So thank have you. a great night and uh, good night to everybody here as well. <laughs> Thank you much. Thanks a lot, Scott. It was really great. Thanks, David. Take care. Bye.